Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session titled The Sexual and Reproductive Health in Migrant and Refugee Communities, Challenges and Solutions to Access. It is truly a pleasure for me to moderate this session. As we know, throughout time, the world has become increasingly interconnected. And with these connections and growing needs and frequency of transport, more people are moving between and within countries. We also know that according to the World Health Organization, there are an estimated 1 billion migrants in the world today, of whom 258 million are international migrants and 763 million are internal migrants, which represents one in seven of the world's population. 70.8 million of the world's internal and international migrants are forcibly displaced today. And unfortunately, we see that this is likely to let me know when to due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this rapid increase of population movement has important public health implications and therefore also creates um, and requires an adequate response from the health sector. And today we'll hear some very um, poignant examples of this. Next slide, please. So before I start, I was asked to introduce myself. Um, my name is Anna Amaya and I'll be today's moderator. I'm an assistant professor at Pace University. I also hold an honorary title as associate research fellow at the UN University. And I was recently elected to serve on the board of directors for Health Systems Global, which is um, a real honor for me to, to be in this role. So my area of expertise is global health governance. I primarily look at the impact of new institutions on health systems of low and middle income countries. And most recently, this re research has focused on the role of regional organizations in health in the global south, as well as health diplomacy, south-south cooperation. And today's topic is obviously very closely related to my own, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our speakers. Next slide, please. So today we have four fantastic speakers who will discuss the issue of migrant health from different perspectives and geographical areas. We will start with um, Ms. Mariana Calderon Jaramillo, who is a qualitative researcher at Profamilia in Colombia. And she'll present on the sexual and reproductive health of Venezuelan migrants in Colombia. Following that, we'll have the presentation from Dr. Niha Singh, who is assistant professor and co-director at the Health Humanitarian's Crisis Center from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Her presentation is titled Forgotten During Humanitarian Crises, Assessing the Evidence Base for Sexual and Reproductive Health Interventions for Young People in Emergency Settings. Following that, we'll have uh, Dr. Sigma Anung, who is project director and senior program officer from the Population Council in Bangladesh. And she will present her study titled Health System Ad Adaptation in Humanitarian Settings, Access to Sexual and Reproductive Health Services among Rohingya in post-displacement to Bangladesh. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Dr. Pooja Sirpad, who is an associate at the Population Council in the USA and she'll present her study titled Near Yet Far, Access to Sexual and Reproductive Health Among Undocumented Migrant and Refugee Women in Mexico. Um, so in terms of the format, uh, once we'll, we'll begin with a brief bio from each of our speakers, and then we'll hear from our speakers, their presentations, and then I'll open up for questions and answers. And I highly encourage you to post your questions in the chat. I'm really looking forward to a lively conversation and uh, really making the most of the expertise of the speakers today. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I do want to remind you uh, how to use the platform. So if you are having any IT issues, make sure to reach out to live support. There is a button in the system where you can click to communicate with them. Um, I already mentioned to please post any questions in the Q&A chat area. And whenever possible, please point out to your question is directed to. And I'll collate those questions after the presentation have finalized and post them, uh, sort of prompt the speakers to respond to them. Sessions are also being recorded, so you can always come back to them if you need to. 
Um, and you can also adjust the screens by using the support buttons. Next slide, please. Great, so let's start. First, we have Ms. Mariana Calderon uh, Jaramillo. Mariana is a sociologist with a specialization in demographic methods, and she holds a master in social studies of science. She is interested in gender studies, sexual and reproductive health, and rights and feminist studies of science and migration. And she is currently a qualitative research analyst at Pro Familia's research office in Bogota, Colombia. Um, please, uh, let's go forward with the presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mariana Calderon Jaramillo. I am a Colombian researcher that is going to present to you a work performed by Profamilia's research team in Colombia, which is called Sexual and Reproductive Health of Venezuelan Migrants in Colombia, Assessment of Barriers and Means for Achieving Universal Health Coverage. First of all, I want to share with you some information about Colombian-Venezuelan migration background, a phenomenon that started in 2016 and has been intensified during recent years. Even though Colombia has not been previously a recipient country, Colombia is now the second country in the world that hosts the most Venezuelans after Venezuela. Nearly one million and a half of Venezuelan immigrants already live in Colombia, and there could be up to 4 million Venezuelan migrants living in our country by 2021. As the following graph shows, Venezuelan migrants in Colombia in 2018 were 46% women and the great majority were in reproductive ages, from 18 to 49 years old, which means they have urgent sexual and reproductive health care needs that should be met by Colombian health system. This research was conducted by Profamilia, a Colombian NGO that has been working in the country for the last 55 years and is known as the biggest provider of sexual and reproductive health services around Colombia. Since 2015, we started evidence that Venezuelan migrants arriving into the country were facing sexual and reproductive unmet needs like unwanted pregnancies, and the increase of sexual and gender violence. We started our humanitarian response by opening services at Borderland and also reaching international aid resources in order to guarantee Venezuelan migrants sexual and reproductive rights. During this process, we tried to learn more about this particular context. That is why during 2019, we performed the first research in the country regarding migrant sexual and reproductive health needs. This was a qualitative research through the implementation of the toolkit for assess the minimum initial service package, also known as MISP for reproductive health in crisis situation designed by interagency working group. Four cities in the Colombian Venezuela border with higher proportion of migrants were assessed, Arauca, Cúcuta, Rio Hacha, and Valledupar. Field work was composed by 23 interviews with key informants in sexual and reproductive health, gender-based violence, and HIV, 20, 21 assessments to healthcare facilities that were providing healthcare for migrants, and 24 focus groups of discussion with migrant women and men from different ages. In total, nearly 300 migrants with different migratory status were enrolled in the research. Ethical approval was granted by Profamilia's Ethical Committee in November of 2019. Among the main results, it was found a lack of knowledge and difficulties in the appropriation of the MIPS goals within humanitarian crisis particularly among those who were in charge of HIV and gender-based violence programs. Furthermore, there were found poor knowledge and difficulties in taking ownership of the MISP. In general, this package was not known in the assessment location. Lack of knowledge and understanding of the MISP 
by the organization responsible for the HMB and gender-based violence prevention and care programs. Weak interagency coordinations in response to sexual and reproductive health, HIV, and gender-based violence. Finally, we prioritize the most significant unmet needs in sexual and reproductive health of Venezuelan migrants, with the purpose to build a ranked order aligned with the five main objectives of the MISP. These figures show the top 10 unmet needs in sexual and reproductive health of the migrants in Colombian Venezuelan border in 2019 for the four cities that we assess. According to the triangulation process, it can be stated that the most urgent and common needs in this context are access to contraceptive methods, safe abortion and post-abortion care, prevention, prevention of STI, and comprehensive prevention of teenage pregnancies. In this sense, it is important to recognize that migrants are facing deep needs even in basic aspects. Our findings sustain that despite the responses, actions, and coordinated efforts of healthcare system and interagency agendas, the minimum, the minimum initial service package for reproductive health in crisis has not been fully implemented to address the needs of migrants in the Colombian Venezuela border. Results also reinforce that despite some essential sexual and reproductive health services that are being provided, these are not yet aligned with the priorities and objectives of the MISP, which demonstrate the lack of recognition of it as a package that saves lives during emergencies. There is a relative installed capacity regarding equipment and healthcare staff, but there are many barriers to effective access, which include insufficient information about how to use services, cause discrimination, and xenophobia from healthcare providers. The lack of appropriation of the MISP is related to poor political will, little understanding of the issues at stake, short-term thinking and not enough commitment from actors responding to this crisis. In other words, it seems to be a problem of preparedness of Colombian health system. Nevertheless, the access to contraception methods and abortion requires a comprehensive care and gender-sensitive approach in the provision of sexual and reproductive health services. Therefore, health policies and programs within humanitarian crisis need to be responsive, responsive to the needs and circumstances of migrant women and girls. Finally, I just want to let you know that the complete research is published in English and can be found in, found in Profamilia's website. We will continue working in generating new evidence useful for guaranteeing sexual and reproductive rights, especially for most vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana, for that presentation. Um, I do encourage everyone to take a look at the study and if you have any questions for Mariana, make sure that you post them in that Q&A area. So now we'll move on to uh, Niha Singh, who is co-director of Health and Humanitarian Crisis Center and assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has a background in public health and expertise in health policy and systems research using mixed methods to improve the prioritization, design and delivery of essential services for women, children and adolescents in humanitarian crisis and under-resourced um, settings. She will present today her study, uh, Forgotten During Humanitarian Crisis, Assessing the evidence base for sexual and reproductive health interventions for young people in emergency settings. You may play. Hi everyone, I'm Neha Singh from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and today I'm going to be presenting findings um, on behalf of my colleagues on a systematic review of sexual and reproductive health interventions for young people, including adolescents, in humanitarian settings. Uh, just to say that this will be quite a brief presentation, but for more detailed methods and findings, please refer to the article we published recently in Conflict and Health. 
So I just wanted to give a quick overview of what is sexual and reproductive health. And the World Health Organization defines it as a right to the highest attainable standard of sexual health, including access to sexual and reproductive health care services, or SRH care services, as I'll now refer to it, to sexuality education and bodily integrity to pursue a satisfying, safe, and pleasurable sexual life. SRH specifically includes family planning, abortion, prevention and treatment of STIs, including HIV, prevention and care for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, and emergency maternal and newborn care. So in terms of crisis-affected populations, what is the scale? Last year, it was estimated that nearly 71 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide, of which 26 million are refugees. Um, and about half of these are estimated to be under the age of 18. Why is it essential to provide SRH in humanitarian settings? Well, we know that about 6 to 14% of displaced women of reproductive age can be pregnant at any given time. And adolescent girls, because their bodies are not fully developed, are at high risk of fatal complications in pregnancy and childbirth or suffering from debilitating injuries such as fistula. Around three quarters of all maternal deaths are due to five causes, all of which can be treated and family planning can prevent about a quarter of these maternal deaths. We know that healthcare provision, including SRH interventions, can reduce negative consequences of disaster on women, girls, families, and communities. Reports of rape and violence during emergencies also detail profound brutality towards girls with far reaching consequences. So failure to address SRH in humanitarian settings leads to maternal and newborn deaths and stillbirths, sexual violence and complications, for example, trauma and STIs, unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortions, and possible spread of HIV and STIs. So the rationale for our study was really that young people are a key population in humanitarian settings, but little is known about the evaluation of SRH interventions directed to them. To date, there have been a number of systematic reviews on SRH interventions in humanitarian settings, but none focused on the young population, this young population. So to address this gap, our review aimed to assess the evidence on the spectrum of SRH interventions being delivered to young people um, and to assess the strategies to increase their utilization and their effects on health outcomes. So the methods, um, I won't go into detail here, please do refer to our paper, but we included, um, we searched the literature from 2000, uh, from 1980 to 2018. We included young people, including adolescents, both male and female, aged 10 to 24 years, living in humanitarian settings in low and middle income countries. We uh, included any interventions aimed at improving SRH outcomes. We included qualitative and quantitative mixed method studies um, in any acute or protracted armed conflict, disease outbreak, or natural disaster. We assessed the quality of these studies, and because the uh, data reported in these studies was quite heterogeneous, uh, we could not do a meta-analysis, so we did a narrative synthesis. So to jump into the results, uh, we screened 1,473 articles, of which we included 14 articles. Nine are peer-reviewed from the peer-reviewed literature and five from the grade literature. For the study design and quality, um, you can see it's quite a range from RCTs to a cohort study, case studies, before and after study, and as well as qualitative studies. And the grey literature reported findings from case studies, RCTs, and one before and after study. Overall, the quality was mainly, uh, with the exception of one article, one qualitative study, the quality was mainly um, deemed to be high or medium. In terms of study settings, one intervention was delivered in an acute disease outbreak setting, three in natural disaster settings, and the remaining 11 were delivered in areas affected by armed conflict. Nine were implemented in sub-Saharan Africa, with one of these interventions also being implemented in Pakistan. It was a multi-country study. Three interventions were implemented only in Asia, and the remaining two um, were in South America and one in the Middle East. In terms of target population, all interventions targeted adolescents with five extending the eligible age to include young people, so that's up to 24 years. Only four interventions included very young adolescents, so 10 to 14 years. Seven interventions did not specify an age range, but mentioned targeting adolescents. And nine interventions targeted both males and females, but only one study provided disaggregated results. While all interventions were inclusive of girls or young women, there were no interventions targeting only boys or young men. The SRH um, domains covered by the interventions, um, about half of them, so nine of them included more than one element of SRH, and the studies focused on preventions of, of unintended pregnancies, prevention um, 
of the transmission of and morbidity and mortality related to HIV and other STIs, maternal and newborn health, um, as well as sexual and gender-based violence. But importantly, we identified no studies on prevention of mother-to-child transmission, safe abortion or post-abortion care, urogenital fistula or female genital mutilation, um, as well as no studies on uh, sexual minorities or young people with disabilities in humanitarian crisis situations. Strategies to increase utilization of SRH services included adolescent friendly spaces, peer workers, involving adolescents, engaging communities, school based activities, mobile clinics, integration with other health services such as HIV, art as a form of health education, including drawing, dancing, and so forth, and adapting radio programs to continue to educate youth when schools shut down during a crisis. So overall, our key findings are that the majority of these studies measured output data, such as number of services provided, utilization rates, and changes in knowledge and attitudes, but fewer studies measured changes in behavior risk. Nearly all studies reported some positive SRH outcomes, the majority of which were changes in knowledge and attitudes, and about half of them reported no effects in SRH outcomes measured. Well, only one study reported a decrease in the number of new and repeat contraceptive clients. So our conclusions are that, okay, the, the, the quantity and quality of, um, the quantity of evidence has increased in the last eight years, um, which shows that it's only recently come on the agenda. But we need a higher quantity and quality of studies documenting interventions, addressing the comprehensive SRH needs of young people and their diversity in a range of humanitarian crisis settings, um, and these data should be collected and analyzed via standardized monitoring systems. It's also important that when SRH data are collected, they're disaggregating using um, standard age groups. Um, and this is to understand gaps in SRH service provision for this population in humanitarian settings, and also to be able to make evidence-based decisions when allocating financial resources. Finally, further research is needed on using economic evaluation as well um, as a method. Um, safe abortion, post-abortion care, PMTCT, urogenital fistula and FGM, young adolescents, sexual minorities, adolescents with disabilities, and more research targeting only boys. Here are some select resources, including on the top right, there's a toolkit on adolescent SRH in humanitarian settings, and here are some additional resources. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neha, for that wonderful presentation. Very interesting systematic review. Um, now we're going to move on to Sigma Inu, who is Project Director and Senior Program Officer at Population Council Bangladesh. She has expertise in the fields of adolescent sexual and reproductive health, as well as women's empowerment. She has more than 10 years of experience working with adolescents and young populations in various settings. And her research also includes child marriage, gender-based violence, education and livelihood opportunities for girls and financial access for the poor. She combines her research with project management experience and technical assistance to the government of Bangladesh. And she also serves as technical committee member of the National Strategy for Adolescent Health and the National Plan of Action for Adolescent Health for the 2017-2020-2030, sorry, period in Bangladesh. I'm really looking forward to her presentation. It is titled Health System Adaptation in Humanitarian Settings, Access to Sexual and Reproductive Health Services Among the Rohingya in Post-Displacement to Bangladesh. Thank you viewers, researchers, and practitioners who have joined with us in this virtual conference from around the world. I'll talk about findings from the quality assessment of sexual and reproductive health practices among the Rohingya. I'm Sigma Inul, I'm with Population Council. I'm based in Bangladesh. To give some context about this Rohingya population and this camp setting, the Rohingya has been fleeing to Bangladesh uh, from Myanmar, Rakhine State to the adjacent districts of Bangladesh, like Baxter in Hill Tracks, for decades. But the most recent influx that started in August 2007, uh, 17 has increased to a fourfold of population Rohingya population in Bangladesh. Currently, about one million uh, Rohingya population are living in these two upazilas of Cox's Bazar, uh, Teknaf and Ukia. And this new influx is fairly young, 60% uh, are below age 18. But historically, we have known very little about this Rohingya population 
due in part to a history of exclusion in Myanmar, the Rohingya have not been included or counted in censuses. So we know very little about their socio-demographic characteristic, family structure, their health, education, or service-seeking behavior, or contraception, or family planning behavior. So when uh, government donors and the NGOs were uh, started this response uh, and services for this Rohingya population in camps, it became very imperative, uh, very necessary to know more about them so that we can design the programs better. Winifei was doing this response services, was leading the response service for sexual and reproductive health for women and girls in crisis. And our study is part of that need assessment. By the time we did our study uh, in 2018, one year has been passed from their dislocation and camp were more or less settled. And we have some information from other studies as well. Um, UNFP and SGB did one service with this reproductive age women. And from that, we knew that uh, the childbearing and child marriages early, uh, uh, age at first pregnancy was average was 18, uh, contraceptive privilege was 34 percent, facility delivery is very, very low. So we wanted to know more. Uh, the, what is the reason behind that? How can we address these barriers and gaps in service uptake? So that was the objective of our study. Uh, we did the qualitative study uh, in July and August 2018. Right hand side of this slide shows some of the uh, geographic uh, understanding of this uh, camp setting. Uh, the larger camp, we have conducted a study in Ukia. The larger camp is again divided into 20 uh, smaller camps, and those 20 camps again divided into blocks were managed by community leaders called Machis. So they are very influential in terms of giving uh, access them to rations, to access them to services. So in our study, we did focus group discussion with this uh, community leaders, the Machis. We have also did a uh, focus group discussion with religious leaders or imams who have very strong influence in this uh, Rohingya community. Uh, we did in the interviews with Rohingya females and males uh, of different age group, married, both married and unmarried. We did uh, in different interviews with program managers and service providers who were directly working with this population. Moving on to the main findings, um, in childbearing and family planning, what we see that religion and the religious leaders plays a major role. And uh, they have, a, across all the respondents, they have a very large preference uh, for large family size. I'll read a quote uh, from a married woman. The Hujurs, the Muslim religious leaders, tell us not to use a contraceptive method. Contraception is seen, Allah made women fertile so that they can bear children. So these, uh, these notion of understanding has been found across the married, unmarried, and service providers. There's the common thing is the contraception they don't really want to prevent, uh, avail. The other thing uh, they mentioned uh, across the board that they want to increase the Muslim clan as there was a lot of killing uh, in Myanmar, so they do not want to use contraception and uh, want to increase their Muslim clan. We have found very widespread of misconception and uh, fear about this use of contraception method. Uh, the, the chemical use in contraception will lose, they will lose their uh, reproductive uh, ability permanently. That is the widespread uh, myth. And also there is a fear of prolonged bleeding and the gatekeepers in the community, especially in the family, the husbands and mother-in-laws, they, um, they take major decision in uh, availing of this contraception behavior and uh, family planning services. Uh, so an omen, I will read a quote from an omen. I wanted to have a pill, but my mother-in-law restricted me. She says, I will die. My husband also did not let me. I tried several times in secret, but couldn't. Women want relief in their body, but husband and their family want children. They say it's Allah's order. The other major finding we found that contraception is very much uh, the link contraception with immorality. Uh, we are uh, hearing from the uh, FGDs and uh, the Maji was saying, bad people use condom for going to bad place. Why would anyone use condom between husband and wife? About the maternal health uh, seeking behavior, we have found that home birth is their long standing uh, practice and that is mostly preferred. One reason is that when they were in Myanmar, there was lack of facilities, so they're very much used to with this home birth. And the other was that there was a fear among them that uh, there will be killing 
uh, of their children if they give birth to facilities the mock people will kill their children so they do not never thought to go to the service uh, facilities and that fear and mistrust still the holds and when we ask them uh, in the camps there was available of health facilities but we see very low uptake and they also mention about that plastic mobility of girls they don't really feel that women will go to a facility and uh, give the birth the transport problem was also mentioned so what can be done to uh, to increase the uh, how how can we reach them better and to uh, move these barriers so what is commonly uh, mostly st uh, struck that the, as there is a mistrust and access that's important so uh, wider community uh, health education awareness need to be done and uh, engaging of these uh, influential leaders the religious leaders and majis are also important especially the majis so that we can work with this husband because they are the major decision maker in use of contraception and family planning services the other thing is to uh, work with this elderly rohingya women who also have very much influence in this uh, female group because uh, rohingya is a very much male dominant community so to access to this woman we have to also use uh, this adult rohingya women as agent of change for adolescent and young pop, uh, people as they were not very much used to, to go this go to the services the service provider need to reach out to them rather than waiting for them come to the facility so mobile outreach need to be uh, increased and engagement of rohingya volunteers along with this bengali service provider uh, will be beneficial and also considering the low literacy level uh, the health education tools the community awareness campaigns should use more audio and visual content so i'll stop here thank you for your patient hearing Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation, Sigma. And I know I have a lot of questions as well. Um, I just want to remind all of our attendees that you may continue, you may start posting questions as the presentations are uh, being shown and I'll collect all of the questions and direct them to the different speakers at the end of the session. So do keep those questions coming and um, hopefully we'll have a, a good discussion at the end. So now we'll move on to Pooja Sripad, uh, who is a social researcher in Population Council's Reproductive Health Program based in Washington, DC. She has experience working in Africa, South Asia, as well as Latin America, and she investigates trust and sociopolitical relationships, norms and respectful care using critical approaches at community and health systems levels including in humanitarian settings. Currently, Dr. Sripad serves as a technical advisor in a wide portfolio, including a multi-country effort to strengthening, for strengthening measurement, as well as evidence and policy in frontline health, evaluating social and provider behavior change interventions in maternal, newborn health and fistula care, as well as a developing research agenda to enhance access to health and social services among migrants and displaced women. Dr. Shripad holds a PhD from the Department of International Health at John Hopkins University, an MPH from Yale University, and a BA in Public Policy from the University of Chicago. She will present today on her study uh, titled Near Yet Far, Access to Sexual and Reproductive Health Among Undocumented Migrant and Refugee Women in Mexico. Thank you all for this opportunity to present some of the work my colleagues and I have been involved with looking at migrant women's sexual reproductive health service access in Mexico. Um, in the context of this conference, we know health equity is uh, paramount and we've been thinking a lot about what this means in the context of populations on the move who may experience different um, challenges along the way. The work I'll be presenting uh, reflects preliminary results from a two-year effort um, that's ongoing. A bit of background, um, there's a lack of evidence on migrant sexual reproductive health service access globally. Um, and particularly in the, an increased uh, presence of undocumented migrants um, in Mexico. This also includes an increase in numbers of refugees and asylum seekers. 
um, though many of these women are have been previously coming from Central America, there's been a recent uptick in migrants coming from Venezuela, Haiti, Cuba, as well as African countries. Um, migrants face a range, as you can see, this pathway is quite long uh, from the southern to northern border. And migrants face a range of challenges, um, both because of their gender, um, their migratory status, as well as some of the violence they may encounter along the way that often um, make them vulnerable and um, also necessitate um, seeking care for various uh, sexual health, reproductive health needs, as well as maternal health care services. So with this background, um, the Population Council, in partnership with the uh, Pro-Choice Alliance, Ministry of Health in Mexico, and a range of civil society organizations, um, has been working to understand what's been done, uh, what interventions exist globally that we can adapt to the Mexican context. Um, for that, we conducted a systematic review of the literature, and then we focused more specifically on Mexico itself to understand the distribution of services available. Um, speaking to both migrant shelters as well as NGOs that serve as the first point of contact for many of these uh, migrant women. Um, the, the organizations we spoke to were diverse. They included international NGOs, community-based NGOs, uh, national NGOs, as well as faith-based organizations um, and feminist organizations. Some preliminary results from the systematic review. Um, after screening over 20,000 um, titles and abstracts, we eventually reviewed 23 full text articles and reached about 11 studies, um, which really means that there, there really is not enough research on interventions in migrant settings. Um, what, what interventions, what works for promoting sexual reproductive health access? Um, what are the services? How should they be del delivered? Things like that. Um, and part of the challenge here was a lack of resources to being able to evaluate the effects. Uh, we see here also sort of a range of types of interventions, um, clinics, some, some mobile, some attached to international organizations, but very few that were linked with the wider health system. Um, in refugee camps, we saw a bit more linkage with community-based interventions. So moving on to Mexico, uh, we conducted our mapping with by talking to a range of service providers. Um, and what we found here is that uh, there, there's quite a bit of services being delivered, but variation in terms of what's being delivered. So one the main, as you can see from the green, referrals were the, the highest or the main type of service provided. Um, and part of this was because there's a lack of resources among a lot of the organizations to be able to offer much more. Uh, for example, only um, very few had less than half had health person, or just about half had less had a health personnel with a medical background that was able to provide some of this these services. Um, we see, for example, abortion services mainly located in Chiapas, Calif Baja California, and Mexico City, while um, in in um, only two, only a couple of the organizations in Chiapas and Baja California had a midwife that could provide contra, uh, delivery care uh, services. This map shows the distribution of sexual reproductive health services in uh, Mexico. Uh, we see here from the green highlighted areas where there were higher sort of a higher service availability and in the red where there was a lower service availability um, and yellow in the middle. We see there's quite a discrepancy between the border states and the uh, central areas of uh, central regions. Um, the highest uh, availability of sexual reproductive health services was in Chiapas, Mexico City, and Baja California states. Um, the, this next slide really, I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the, the qualitative work um, interviews that we were having and, and heard what we heard from the stakeholders. Um, so we found this quote really articulates the complexity and overlapping challenges faced by migrant women. We see here gender-based violence, lack of abortion access, and then moving forward sort of insufficient pregnancy care that can really place women um, at great risk for, for negative health outcomes. Um, there's a cross-cutting fear around documentation and what that means um, in terms of their deterring women to accessing care at public health institutions. We also see that um, from the, the quote here that, res that respondents or the um, 
service providers across different organizations are often sharing the responsibility of where women go and how women get care, and it's often a spontaneous process. This uh, slide speaks to the broader themes that are coming out and linkages that um, we are hearing from the service providers across the different uh, NGOs and CBOs in Mexico. Um, what we're hearing a lot about is this diversity of needs um, at the, uh, of women themselves. For example, menstrual hygiene came up um, as a key area that really was a challenge for, for many women in their, in their uh, movement through Mexico. Health seeking behaviors are often a challenge and these, these challenges have been um, exacerbated in the context of COVID actually, um, as have been the sort of limited space and availability um, in the NGOs as first point of contact. Um, many of the NGOs um, and CBOs describe sort of a limited capacity to really fully address comprehensive needs of, of migrant women and, and an important and cited the importance of working together to be able to do this. One challenge is around the cultural acceptability of talking about and addressing sexual reproductive health needs as well as gender-based violence. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to say that implementation research um, really is important to better understand what interventions work in migrant settings um, and in Mexico specifically. Uh, we also know that migrants face, un face unique challenges. One thing that I didn't mention from this previous slide is there was a huge uh, challenge around follow-up of women. Women often don't stay in a place for very long, and so unique strategies are necessary to be able to follow up and ensure continuity of care and positive health outcomes for women. Um, and finally, beyond the political and uh, sort of legal frameworks that might be supportive uh, of caring and treating migrants, um, there's a need to strengthen alliances and networks to be able to do this in a timely way and in an effective way. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I now uh, welcome everyone to share their videos, the panelists to share their videos so we can have a discussion. We already have a few questions, really wonderful questions related to some of the, related to a few of you um, specifically. So first let's start um, with this question around abortion. So how do you approach research and abortion in settings where abortion is not fully um, available by law. I think that's most relevant to Bangladesh and Mexico perhaps. So I don't know um, if uh, Sigma, you have any thoughts on that? We can start with you. Hi, uh, we found very, we also did ask about the abortion and also in the discussion of this quality study, the abortion issue came up, but there's a high stigma among the Rohingya population regarding the abortion. Uh, particularly they said it's seen, and also we didn't uh, offer the abortion services, as we call MR in Bangladesh. Also in Bangladesh, we don't use the term abortion, but in the camp that they say they don't go for abortion. And some spoke about using the traditional methods like some other stuff, but those very limited. They strictly don't do don't do prefer uh, abortion. That's what we found. Well, yeah, do you have anything to add related to that? Sure, I think it's a really important question, um, especially, you know, given it is a tricky topic to broach. Um, in Mexico, we um, actually did the work through uh, in collaboration with a with a number of partners that are working on pro-choice. So abortion was actually front and center of the study itself, which gave us a little bit of um, sort of a, 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 you know, just shows how collaboration and building that platform is important to even start to talk about these issues. So I think that is that is that was a big part of how we were able to gain access. Um, and then working with international organizations um, was was kind of uh, part of it too. And in this and in this case, we were talking to a lot of the data I presented today it was more around some of the stakeholder interviews. And so there, it's a little bit more. It's easier to talk about abortion um, in the client phase, which we're starting now. It's a little bit more complicated, but I think um, you have to be aware of the the norms um, and how to approach the topic, uh, as well as 
you know, work with the right collaborators to, to be able to do it. Essentially important, yes, to be able to include everyone in, in the discussion um, and to also ensure the participants that it's confidential, ensuring those, um, those rights to confidentiality, which are always a bit tricky. There's another really interesting question regarding um, your opinion of what you think the role is for sending countries, so countries uh, where migrants originate from in addressing the health needs of the migrants. Mariana, do you want to take that question on regarding Venezuela? Yes, I, I think that it's very difficult because relations between both countries are not easy. But uh, as an association of IPPF, we have been working with uh, uh, at another association similar like Pro Familia, and they are like sending people from Venezuela to our services. That, that's a way to guarantee that people that arrive into Colombia find accessible services quickly and timely. I think that uh, we, we have to work more in the other side of the border or in the countries of origin of migrant population because this, this guarantees that people arrive and get safe services, particularly regarding abortion, but in other types of services, and also to identify where they can find a services that are uh, free or subsidized by NGOs and uh, agency responding to the emergency. Wonderful. And I wonder, Niha, if you found any evidence of this in your um, systematic review, uh, what the role was from sending countries. Well, sorry, the, could you just repeat the last section? Um, yeah. So what responsibility do countries uh, from where migrants originate, so the sending countries have in addressing the health needs of migrants? Of course, yeah. So I think an important distinction to make is we didn't actually look at migrant health. We looked at refugee health. Um, and the, you know, refugees fall under the protection of UNHCR, whereas IOM deals with migrant health overall. So I think, so. I actually can't speak to that very much, um, especially from the systematic review. Um, yeah, sorry, maybe, I don't know if someone else on the panel can. No problem. Um, we also have another question regarding sexual violence. Um, how do you approach research uh, on sexual violence in close religious communities where it's very difficult to have an open, open dialogue about sexual health? Any of you want to take that one on? I can have a go. Um, so just to say, I don't specialize in, in research on sexual and gender based violence, but there are um, there are a lot of guidelines on how to do this ethically and safely, both for the researchers and uh, and participants. I think especially during COVID, um, there's been a lot of calls by by people who have worked in, on the, in this field for years to say, actually stop and think about, is this even necessary? Because we know, and we, we no longer need data to know that um, epidemics and pandemics sort of exacerbate um, sexual and gender-based violence and they increase it and so forth. So I think um, what I can do, maybe I'll, um, I'll put myself on pause and I'll, I'll look up, there's some brilliant resources on, on SGBV um, on, and how to, how to collect data that I'll, I'll especially um, in, in, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about uh, in areas of sort of forced displacement because that's mainly where I work, but I'll, I'll pop some links in the chat box. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there is a specific question directed to Dr. Shrikat. Um, is menstrual hygiene part of reproductive healthcare services? Can we do studies in Mexico? Sure, and I can speak to a couple of the other points as well. I think, um, so in terms of menstrual hygiene, it's just something that um, came up a lot when you were talking to agencies about what women are asking for as they're going through. And, and that is a part of young women, or especially young women, but um, we've seen in other, other uh, countries that that's a very, key area. Um, and so it's it's no different in migrants, essentially. Um, this is still a very important issue in within the context of sexual reproductive health. Um, in terms of the, the 
just to speak to the SGB, I do think that there are a number of resources, and I'm glad that Neha has um, sending some of the links, and especially the IWAG has done a lot of work in sort of thinking through some of the sort of challenges that um, come up when working, especially in humanitarian settings with um, the issue of SGBV. And so we, we have a lot to learn from them. Um, I also think that um, working with partners and shelters, and that's how we broached it. So work, working with the people that are working to support women who have had, who've undergone gender-based violence is a big part of it. So again, I, I really encourage um, those interested in working on this to, to think about who and how they're partnering in a way that really protects the woman and doesn't um, place her at any um, undue disadvantage. I mean, just at, at increased risk. So I think what we found is there are some unique risks and strategies, and we're trying to look at that more that women use compared to migrant men, for example. And so, so that's something we're exploring more in the future. Um, and I, the, the regional, uh, sorry, the question around sending countries, I think is really important to consider when looking at whether it's undocumented or other you know, refugees and asylum seekers, because it, it has to be a little bit of a, I would say a regional response to some degree, um, and maybe even broader when you think about some of the migrate, like what the movements look like. Um, I think in Latin America, a regional strategy can be helpful, um, for example. Wonderful, I completely agree, obviously, because I'm interested in how countries collaborate together for health. So um, really good point. I also had a question for um, Sigma. Uh, your presentation really wonderfully gave some examples of how uh, there are some links between trauma, fear, and practices for sexual and reproductive health. I wonder if you've um, considered or identified any interventions that address the mental health needs of the refugees? I don't think we can hear you, Sigma. It must be an issue with the video. Hello? Yes, we hear you now. Can you please, uh, repeat your question? My connection got froze. I couldn't hear oh. you. No problem. Okay, just to repeat the question. Yes, your presentation gave really good examples of the links between trauma and fear from these refugees and uh, sexual, which was reflected in those sexual practices as well. Um, have you identified or um, do you know of any interventions to address the mental health needs and this link between mental health issues and also uh, practices for sexual and reproductive health? Hello, I could uh, hear part of your question, but I understood that there is a mental health referrals or uh, considering the sexual violence will happen uh, with them. Yes, we have women friendly centers in uh, Rohingya camp run by UNFPA and also run by Action Aid, Save the Children, several other NGOs are doing these services. And especially these women uh, friendly centers, here the women can come and they can have a share, safe space with others as well. And also uh, specifically working with mental health, there are different strategies. Some are working with children to do uh, art and other uh, mechanism. And especially the SRH is linked with this uh, violence support and this uh, mental health support through the women friendly health centers in the camp and as we do research as well as we talked with this woman about their srhr service sometimes they all these things come up so specifically there was some ethics and the you know, research team referred to them to this women friendly health centers wonderful well um we do, I don't see any more questions, so I'm going to open it up for any final remarks uh, from each of you. If you have any final thoughts, um, either on what are next steps for your research or the current scenario, obviously COVID-19 is on everyone's mind and how you think that will also impact your work. I'll allow, um, maybe we start with Mariana. Thank you. I just wanted to 
add that we recently published in the Journal of Migration and Health uh, a paper about gender and sexual based violence, gender based violence and sexual violence on Venezuela migrant population. And it, it remarks that uh, Venezuelan migrants are facing a continuum of violence because we have to uh, get help not only for the violence that they, they suffer during crossing the borders, but also for violence that they uh, experience before migrate. And we also found that usually Venezuelan migrants are thinking that after sexual violence, they have to reach the police, but many of them are irregular migrants. So this will be a huge barrier in order to uh, solve and respond to their, to their violence. And uh, regarding our uh, currently path on migration research, we still uh, keep uh, getting new evidence about pro-familias intervention. So, uh, many of the things that we we share here say that there are not enough evidence about evidence but and interventions, but we are trying to collect as many evidence as possible uh, about what happens after we gave services to migrant populations. So uh, we have recently published another research that is also available in ProFamilias website. And in the next few months, we are going to publish about what happened to Venezuelan migrants when they get our services? Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Niha, any final wrap up words? Sure, um, so I think just reflecting on, on the, the systematic review, but also other work I'm doing um, with refugee adolescents and, and other settings, I think there's there really is a need for higher quantity, but also quality of studies. We know that many humanitarian actors are, of course, including adolescents in their programming, and, and we don't expect them to be doing rigorous research. But what I was really struck by when when um, my colleagues and I did the systematic review is just how little. Um, you know, while there is some evidence that some interventions for young people are being implemented, there's just insufficient details on specific intervention components and outcome measurements to be able to actually know what's effective, what's working better, what's working less. And I think that's on um, academics to really join hands with people implementing in the field to come up with come up with these um, sort of uh, measures and to, to, to better, um, you know, to better know what to scale up, what to fund, what not to fund. I think especially during COVID, we've seen the indirect impacts are on um, key services for women and adolescents and children, including SRH. So when priorities are really, um, when, when resources are really constrained, how do you prioritize? And I think knowing which interventions are, re are evidence-based and will, will really have an impact on adolescents in, in humanitarian settings. I think that, that would go a long way. Um, so yeah, my call would be to, um, whether you're um, in academia, if you're a policymaker, if you're an implementer, to think about ways um, to join hands with the right people to actually start collecting gender and sex disaggregated data from the very start of your, your programming or your studies and to figure out sort of what your outcome measures are to see how, if, if the strategy worked or not. Thank you, Nina, really important reflection and uh, also a reminder that we should really take advantage of forums such as um, this conference where we're bringing together researchers, policymakers, implementers to really converse with each other. That's really the goal of conferences like this one and not only converse with each other, but also try to work together as well and collaborate. Um, any final thoughts, Sigma? Yes, under, during COVID, we are doing this uh, phone service remotely with you know, our lesson in our other kind of researches. But in humanitarian, could not uh, able to do that. Actually, we will have some ongoing research on livelihood in some with, in the same Rohingya camp. But in the middle of the pandemic, you have to stop that because you can't move there in person. And also in the Rohingya camp, the phone uh, will not recently there was a uh, directive from the government. You can't have the phone legally in the Rohingya camp, the refugees. So you couldn't do reach them over phone uh, in the Rohingya camp. But in other setting we are doing uh, 
over phone, the COVID related uh, rapid service that listen to address our programs better. And so on. But I also agree with the thing that during the violence and the sexual violence related data, we, we already have much. We don't need to do the phone survey and get collected whether she's valid because we don't know in what setting she is. When she's talking with me, maybe that's really exacerbate her uh, chance to get into more violence from our partners. So we have to be really cautious what kind of research we are trying to do and uh, what is the reason behind that. Do we need to do more data or to design the programs better? Thank you, and I completely agree. Really important to, as researchers, prioritize also what we're looking at and make sure that we're always protecting uh, the participants as well. Any final words, Pooja, from you? Um, I think my colleagues here have said most of it. I, I'll just echo and, and sort of say the same again, is that I think that there's more work that needs to be done in terms of interventions and implementation. Um, it, whether I, I know we spoke a little bit about young people, but I would say migrants in general, um, there's there's just not a good sense of what what's working well, how it works. Um, and and whether you know classic humanitarian myths, for example, can be used in in, um, in migrant populations in a way is it tailored? How can you tailor it? Um, and I think that there's there's some work, but there could be more. And I know from work talking a lot with practitioners, um, these collaborations are really part of what what's going to make that happen. So if we can collaborate better as academics and um, and practitioners on this work. Um, and try to do it the best we can. I think that's sort of that's sort of how it, what it goes for these types of populations. Um, so I think you know it's exciting. It's an exciting time, and it's a, it ripe for research um, and and practice. Um, and I think COVID has just shown us that you can't. I mean, I think this is the moment to say yes. This is important. This has been important for a long time, but it's bringing to light some of these issues in a new way. Um, so I think that's. Um, yeah, and in terms of our specific work in Mexico, we are, it's been, you know, just, it's, I would say in general, this, this area is underfunded. And so if there's any donors listening, I would say really think about supporting more of this kind of work, given, you know, we're working, just trying to, to sort of scrape together what we can to paint a picture so we can then do a more robust study um, to really look at interventions. And, and I think um, that's, that's what a lot of people in this field are doing. So when they're looking at, at, these, at these groups. So I think that's just a, a plea for more funding in this space. Um, and we're, we're hoping to just build on this in the future. Fantastic, and I agree. Um, this is an area that still needs a lot of investment and a lot of attention. And uh, we can't wait for crises to happen. It's, continuously need to be investing and paying attention to these issues. And also really important um, thoughts that COVID-19 has really shifted all of our uh, lives, uh, affected thousands and millions of lives, but also as much as possible, we should take it as an opportunity to revitalize um, our strategies, our priorities, and uh, continue this very important work. Uh, I thank all of these panelists, you've been wonderful. I really enjoyed watching your presentations and the discussion. Um, I think we can uh, move on to the slide. I, I want to remind everyone that you can get back to the timeline to watch, uh, continue to participate in the conference. There are a number of other uh, sessions coming up after this. Uh, so do continue to uh, participate. You can also uh, share thoughts with the presenters as well. You have their contact details in the, in the platform. And uh, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the week and thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.